actually the choir anthem and the song we learn, the deep, deep love of Jesus, is a beautiful prelude, a perfect prelude into today's message. Um, and I do have to tell you I'm going to stall for a little bit here because we put together the services carefully so that the choir has a chance to go down, come back up into the sanctuary during the offering. So when I misread the sheet and did the offering first, now they're having to hurry. So I'm going to stand here and just tell a few jokes. <laughs> well, like many of you here today, uh, my mom and dad have a beautiful love story. They are in the twilight years of that story. My mom is 89, my dad is 86, and both are dealing with health issues that come with the aging process. And they've been married for 63 years, 64 this coming August, and like many great love stories, uh, theirs had um, an unlikely beginning. Uh, My mom grew up in the hills of eastern Kentucky in a family where girls, and there were four of them in her family, just didn't go to college. They were expected to either get married as teenagers or go to work, but they did not go to college. But my mom was a good student. Actually, she was the valedictorian of her high school class. I found this picture this week. Uh, And she loved to study. But when she graduated, she went to work like her family expected. And she worked for four or five years until she finally got up the courage to tell her parents she wanted to go to college. She enrolled at Taylor University in Indiana as a 24-year-old freshman. Uh, My dad, on the other hand, grew up the youngest of six children uh, in uh, a single-parent home. His father had passed away when he was only about five years old, leaving his mom to raise six children in post-depression America. To say they were poor would have been a great understatement. But my dad came to faith in Christ as a teenager and immediately felt called to preach. So he went to a Bible college for one year in Iowa. There he is, good-looking guy studied there, and then after a year he transferred to Taylor University, where he was a student, but he also pastored some rural congregations because he needed to earn his way through school. Now, my dad noticed the slightly older new girl early that fall, and shortly after he noticed her, he approached her, I think, in the library, and he said to her, "Uh, would you like to go out to dinner sometime? She was kind of surprised, and she responded that she would. And then for reasons my dad still can't explain, he said to her, okay, uh, I'll ask around and see if I can find somebody to take you. And And my mom to this day says she's still mad at him for that particular line. Well, eventually he asked her appropriately, and then somewhat surprisingly she, she said yes. And at that very first date, and this is their story, at that very first date he said, If you don't want to get serious with me, then don't date me anymore because I intend to marry you. And he did. Now, we're looking at one of the great love stories of the Bible. It comes to us in the book of Ruth. And the story unfolds before us as we read it, kind of like a dramatic play, with key characters being introduced to us scene after scene. A little recap. First, we meet this man named Elimelech, who takes his wife Naomi and their two sons, from Israel to Moab because there's a famine. Uh, And then we meet Ruth, who is one of the Moabite women that the two sons marry eventually. And then um, Elimelech dies, and then the two sons die, and Naomi and Ruth, the two of them, come back to Bethlehem in Israel. And there we are introduced to the next big character, who is a man named Boaz, a prominent and wealthy man who happens to be a family relative of Elimelech's Naomi's late husband, a very special relative, one that's called a guardian redeemer. Now today we come to chapter 3, and the drama becomes an unlikely love story. Let me read for you, and I'll stop several places along the way. Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Let me pause here. Uh, This is Naomi's way of saying it's time to find you a husband. Now, we don't know exactly how long they've been back in the Bethlehem area. We know they arrived during the beginning of the barley harvest, and we know that Ruth's been gleaning in Boaz's field from the last couple of weeks, if you were here. Uh, So probably this is a month or a month and a half later, toward the end of the harvest season. Winter is coming, and so Naomi is thinking it's about time. You need to find a permanent solution to this. Verse 2, now Boaz, this is still... Uh, uh, Naomi talking. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now this is just describing the ancient process uh, of separating grain from the stalk at harvest time 
uh, in that part of the world. Naomi says, wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go over and, and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now, okay, what in the world is going on here? <laughs> now, we are so immersed in a culture of promiscuity that we're quick to assume that we know what's happening here or what's going to happen here. And this is very much a love story as we're going to see, but it's not what we might think. The first thing we see here in chapter 3 is Naomi's hope. Naomi's hope. So my mom and dad got married on August 20th, 1955, and I was born on their first wedding anniversary. Um, now, I have an explanation for my appearance here. Uh, I was born about a month premature. I only weighed a little over six pounds, and I cried a lot. So my, the only thing my mom knew to do was to give me bottles of whole milk and A&W root beer. <laughs> Might have been my dad's idea. I don't know what. So I went from six pounds, and at 10 months of age, I weighed 30 pounds. That's the explanation <laughs> of that. My dad was a pastor. My mom was a pastor's wife. And I often tell people that I don't remember a single day in my life not a single day, when I didn't know that Jesus loved me and had significant, amazing plans and ideas for my life. And I learned that not through sermons, because even though my dad was a pastor, I was too young to understand sermons then, but I learned that, I think, through the prayers of my parents. We had a ritual every evening, which was bath time, pajama, pajamas on, brush teeth, get in bed, and then my, one of my parents would come up and they would tuck us in, and they would pray over us. I think that's where I learned how Jesus loved me. Every night, my mom or my dad would pray over us, and they would pray that we would know God's love for us, God's blessing on our lives, and God's direction in our lives. My wife and I did the same thing with our boys as they grew up, but my mom often included uh, something else in her prayers. I don't remember my dad doing it, but my mom would do it. And she would pray something like this, Lord, I pray for the little girl out there who will someday become our son's wife. I ask you to protect her and mold her into the young woman you want her to be so that she will be the godly and loving woman you want for Brian. I'd be like, Mom, I'm 12. <laughs> but she prayed that over and over again um, because she wanted God's best for me and for my life. And I'm very glad that she did. And I think that's what Naomi's doing here. Verse 1 says, One day Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now, at this point in the story, we know that Naomi knows that Boaz is this family relative who is wealthy and prominent, a godly man who is their guardian redeemer. Now, remember that what that phrase means. It means that he had to be a blood relative of Elimelech, her late husband. It meant that under ancient law, he had the right and the responsibility to redeem. That is to buy back all of Elimelech's property, to take care and provide for Elimelech's family, and even to take Elimelech's widow as his own wife to ensure that his family line would continue. This was extremely important in the ancient world, that your family line would continue. But Naomi has noticed that Boaz has noticed Ruth, the young Moabite widow. So even, he, she's noticed because even though Ruth is a Moabite, even though she's a foreigner, Boaz has allowed her to glean in his fields. He has spoken to her personally. He has offered her protection. He invited her to his table and shared with her his bread and his wine, which last week we pointed out reminds us of how Jesus sat at the table and shared bread and wine with his disciples. He loaded her down with 30 pounds of barley grain. Remember the pancake mix I had up here last week? plus leftovers from lunch. He told her not to go to any other field to glean, but to only come to his field because, one, he could protect her, and two, he had taken notice of her. So Naomi thinks the time is right now that Boaz might be responsive to the idea of marriage. So she's doing a little matchmaking. But there's more than that going on here as well because I think Naomi is beginning to hope again. Remember Naomi's journey to this point. She had been to Moab following Elimelech there. 
Now, Moab was a place of cursing far from the place of God's blessing. She's been there. She lost everything, and she's returned as a broken and bitter woman. Remember, she said, I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. She had lost hope. But Ruth had sought favor. She had gone out to glean. She wound up in the field of Boaz, and Boaz offered her hesed. Remember that beautiful Hebrew word that means the abundant and extravagant kindness of God. And now we see that through Ruth and Boaz, Naomi is beginning to hope again. Verse 2, now Boaz, this is Naomi speaking, with whose women you have worked is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now, two things here. First, Naomi's hope is, is pure. Now, this is not Naomi telling Ruth to, to seduce Boaz. Uh, for Ruth... To lie down at Boaz's feet would have been considered in that culture not an act of seduction, but rather an act of submission. So Naomi's encouraging Ruth to trust herself to her guardian redeemer. I'm going to talk about more, more about that in just a minute. Secondly, Naomi's hope is, not, is selfless. Now think about this for a moment. If Boaz is the guardian redeemer because he's a blood relative of Elimelech, her late husband, who then has the most direct claim to Boaz as redeemer, as potential husband? It's Naomi, right? Naomi. Elimelech was her husband. But Naomi's telling Ruth to go to Boaz. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. First, because Naomi recognizes that Boaz has noticed Ruth, that he's taken an interest in her. Naomi recognizes that Ruth is the younger of the two. Naomi is likely beyond childbearing years here. And the whole point of the guardian redeemer was to continue the family line so she knows that while she would not be able to bear children, Ruth can do so. And more than that, what I see is that Naomi's hope is no longer anchored in her circumstances, but rather now in the provision, in the kindness, in the hesed, of God that she sees in Boaz. So the first thing we see in this part of the story is Naomi's hope. The second thing we see is Ruth's surrender. Ruth's surrender. Uh, I've shared many parts of this story before. You may remember it, but uh, my wife and I also met at Taylor University years after my parents did. And uh, she was a student there. I was on staff at that time. And uh, in the very early days of our courtship, I was most definitely the pursuer, and she was the pursuee. I had noticed her, but she had not noticed me, at least not in that way. And so I desperately wanted to um, get her attention to try to win her favor, uh, and I needed the strategy. Right, guys? You need a strategy if you're going to do that. And the strategy I decided on w was omnipresence. We're on a college campus, so I memorized her daily schedule. When she went to class, I was there. She went to chapel, I was there. When she went to lunch, I was there. Say so you call that stalking. I, I get that. <laughs> but that's what I did. But even though I had a strategy, which, by the way, worked, even though I had a strategy, had she not eventually surrendered, I would have just been running around, right? Naomi here has a strategy, but Ruth is the one who must surrender. Verse 5, I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. You can feel the drama sort of progressing. Now just a word here about, about what was going on, about the wine in the ancient world. Some have suggested that Naomi was telling Ruth to wait till after he, uh, Boaz had eaten and had something to drink so that he would be drunk with wine, so she could seduce him. That's not what's going on here. Uh, it's true that wine was considered a symbol of God's abundance, of God's blessing, and harvest was a time of great celebration in ancient Israel. For example, Psalm 104 tells us, you cause 
you, O God, cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man. So wine was seen as God's provision and God's great blessing. Yet, in the ancient world, drunkenness was seen as a great shame. A shameful sin. So we can assume that while Boaz was celebrating the harvest with his workers, that he was sleeping on the threshing floor, not because he was too inebriated to leave, but because he was protecting his crops from any sort of thieves that might come in and take them. Verse 7. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. Now, he doesn't recognize Ruth because it's dark. It's the middle of the night. He's just woken up from sleep. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Again, what is going on here? Now, we're quick to assume, again, that maybe something racy or illicit is happening. I mean, spread the corner of your garment over me, uncovering feet. Um, but we already know that Boaz is... Um, a man of outstanding spiritual character. We learned that earlier in the story. We know that Ruth has already shown herself to be a respectful woman. So what's she doing here? Here's a clue. Remember the story in the New Testament, I think told in all four Gospels, of the woman who came to the dinner uninvited and then anointed Jesus' feet? Remember that? Luke chapter 7, Luke tells us that uh, Jesus was at a, a, a dinner and at table, And a sinful woman approached him from behind, stood behind him at his feet, and then anointed his feet with uh, expensive perfume, and then wiped his feet with her hair. Jesus then pointed to her as an example of repentance and faith, and then forgave her sins. So for Ruth to lie at the feet of Boaz was highly symbolic in that culture. Ruth is offering herself as a servant to Boaz. She even says so. I am your servant, Ruth. Ruth is surrendering herself to Boaz as her redeemer. Now, here's the cultural situation. Boaz was the goel. That's the Hebrew word for guardian redeemer. That meant that Naomi had the right to expect him to redeem her. She had a legal right for Boaz to redeem her, to marry her. But Naomi sends Ruth and encourages her, don't demand, just offer yourself Surrender as his humble servant, and he will tell you what to do. In other words, completely trust the goodness, the character, and the hesed, kindness, of your guardian redeemer. Notice what Ruth says here. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me. Now that was a cultural way of saying, I'm a widow. I have no hope other than you as my redeemer. Will you please take me, marry me, take me as your wife? Now, interesting here, the Hebrew word translated corner, as in corner of your garment, kanaf, is the same word that Boaz used earlier, translated wings, when he said in verse 12 of chapter 2, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward given, be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings, same word, You have come to take refuge. Do you see it? Ruth is taking refuge in Boaz. She's asking Boaz to answer the prayer he already prayed for her. That is, she is trusting him with her whole life, with her future, with her destiny. And this is a picture of the gospel. This is a picture of faith. In Luke chapter 8, we read a story of a woman who's suffering from a painful and humiliating medical condition just called an issue of blood. In that world at that time, that issue would have rendered her unclean ceremonially, would have made her an outcast in her community, even to her own family. But she's heard about Jesus of Nazareth. So she fights her way through a crowd, and she doesn't even call out his name. When she gets close enough to him, she just prostrates herself, and in desperation and hope and faith, she reaches out and she grabs hold of what? The hem of his garment. That's the same concept, the same word, the corner of your garment, under your wing. She grabs hold, and immediately she is healed because she has trusted herself, and she has found refuge in the one who is her redeemer. I wonder if you remember 
the moment when you first reached out to touch the hem of his garment yourself. That is, the moment you recognized Jesus and surrendered to Jesus as your Redeemer. If you do, in a sense, your story starts right here in the book of Ruth, in the middle of the Old Testament. We see Naomi's hope, we see see Ruth's surrender, and then the third thing we see is the promise of Boaz. The promise of Boaz. Pick it up again in verse 10 of chapter 3. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. Now, evidently, uh, Boaz is somewhat older than Ruth and is impressed that she has not sought out a younger man, but rather has come to him as her guardian redeemer. Verse 11, And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. That's the same phrase, by the way, that was used to describe Boaz earlier in chapter 2. So we have a man of outstanding spiritual character. We have a woman of outstanding spiritual character. You might say this is a marriage made in heaven. Verse 12. Although it is true that I am a garden redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Now this is a little monkey wrench into the story. Like, wait, what? What? There's another man who has a closer relationship to Elimelech and so has first dibs on the widow. Evidently, maybe an uncle, a great uncle, who knows how the family tree was structured. And Boaz is committed to doing this thing, but doing it right. Verse 13, stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized, and he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. Now, I want you to see that this is uh, not a cover-up of something illicit that took place at the threshing floor. Uh, Harvest was a time of great celebration. There was lots of wine and lots of of, uh, rejoicing, and it was known at that time um, that women of ill repute would make their way to the threshing floor and make themselves available to some of the workers. And so, Boaz did not want Ruth to be seen as one of them. So Boaz is still protecting Ruth and her reputation. Verse 15. He also said, Bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. Now, a measure of barley here is sort of like a handful You remember that I had the 30 pounds of pancake mix up here because an ephah was 30 pounds worth of barley mix. This is way less than that. Uh, This is just six handfuls he puts in a shawl. Now, this was not intended to sustain as food. This was a symbolic gift in that culture. This is like a down payment for Naomi that Boaz is giving uh, to indicate his intentions are true. Verse 16, when Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me this, these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Now Naomi knows exactly what those six measures mean. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So Boaz makes a promise. It's actually a very solemn vow he makes. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do all you ask. His promise is to redeem, to take her as his own. Many of you have probably heard the story through the years. I've used it here before, the story of Dr. Robertson McQuilkin, who back in the 70s and 80s was president of Columbia Bible College. I think it's now called Columbia International University. Uh, and seminary, and when his wife Muriel was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, uh, he uh, resigned his position as seminary and college president to care for her full time, which he did all the way until her death years later. Uh, But Dr. McQuilkin was still speaking sometimes, still traveling the country, so while she was, when she was able, he would still travel with her to go different places to speak. And 
he told a story of being in an airport somewhere in, in America uh, on his way to speak, and she was with him. And she, as they sat there at the gate, uh, she was asking him question after question, uh, which he patiently answered uh, time after time. Uh, and she would get up and wander off and, in her confusion, and he would go walk after her and bring her back to the gate. And all this time while this is going on, uh, there was a, a female uh, business executive sitting at the same gate working on her laptop computer, on her notes, or out of her briefcase or something. And they kept walking back and forth in front of this woman. And at one point, Dr. McQuilkin overheard the woman say something, but he didn't hear what she said. So he assumed that maybe they were bothering her. And so he stopped to apologize. He said, oh, well, I'm, I'm so sorry. And that lady said, no, 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 no. I, that's not what I was saying. She said, I was just saying to myself, I wonder if I'll ever find a man to love me like that, she said. Naomi, in this story, wondered if she would ever know hope again. She wondered if Elimelech's line would disappear forever from history. Ruth wondered if she would ever have a husband again, ever have a family again. And I meet people all the time who look at their lives Look at their circumstances, look at their losses, look at their failures, and wonder the same thing. Will I ever know hope again? Has God forgotten me? Has he forgotten that I even exist? Is he punishing me for some reason? And maybe you've had a season where you wonder something like that. The story of Ruth is in our Bible for many, many reasons. And over the next two weeks, you're going to see more clearly why as the story unfolds. But one of the reasons is here is to remind us there is one who loves us like that. There is one who loves you like that. There's one who knows you, who has the resources, whose kindness is toward you, who is willing to redeem, and one who promises to redeem. And what we do is surrender to his promise. It's the story of the gospel. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, today we thank you for your word, for this beautiful love story, really. And help us to see that it's not just an ancient story from a different time and place, full of different cultural customs and things that are hard to understand, but it's also our story. It's the story of your love for each one of us. Help us to anchor our hope not in our circumstances, not in our past, but in your hesed kindness, your great and abundant kindness and love. And may we surrender to you, the one who is our Redeemer. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.